from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. We are the reading and book promotion arm of the library. Uh, we're fortunate that we are part of a national network of reading promoters. There are now centers for the book in all 50 states that we work with. And we are also associated with the author program for the National Book Festival. And this year, the book festival will be held on September 29th, which is a little advance notice for you. Uh, we enjoy presenting authors through this series called Books and Beyond, presenting authors that have some kind of a special connection with the Library of Congress, either are people who are heavy users of the Library of Congress, have used the collections, or have worked with us in different programs. And it's always a source of satisfaction for me to be able to hold up a book, a real book that has been produced by a real author, whom you're going to hear from in just a few minutes. We always co-sponsor our programs as well. And in this case, our co-sponsor is the Serial and Government Publications Division of the Library of Congress, which you will hear a little bit about in a moment because I'm going to have our speaker introduced uh, by Georgia Higley. Georgia is the head of the newspaper section in uh, the, the Serial and Government Publication Division. And I want to thank her uh, for suggesting John as a speaker. And I'm pleased that uh, we are all here to enjoy his presentation. There will be a book signing, a question and answer period following, uh, plus a book signing. Uh, we are able to uh, film this presentation to be seen later uh, on the library's website and also on the Center for the Books website. Uh, we hope you will ask questions. Uh, he has a lot of answers. But if you do answer a question, if you do ask, if you ask, a question, uh, please, that is your permission for us to use your image and your question uh, as part of the website presentation. So uh, that is one way that we try to perpetuate not only the, tr the uh, questions and answers that our authors have, but also uh, the presentations. And if you go to the website now, uh, the Center for the Book portion, we have around more than 65 talks that we have presented since the year 2000, since the year 1998, actually, that are available on the website. I now would like to turn the meeting over to the session over to Georgia Higley to introduce our speaker. Georgia? Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to introduce uh, John Dickerson. Um, it's always it's always great to have uh, both a practicing journalist and a user of newspapers to um, to talk and exp and give his experience about how to create this book on her trail. My mother, Nancy Dickerson, TV News first woman star. Uh, John Dickerson is currently Slate Magazine's chief political correspondent. And prior to joining Slate, uh, he covered politics for 12 years at Time Magazine. And four of those years, he was the magazine's White House correspondent. So it's particularly apropos that he's um, covering his mother's. Um, he's written extensively on more recent affairs, such as uh, President Bush's efforts to curb terrorism, his domestic policy, and political strategies. Uh, Dicker, John has interviewed uh, George Bush a number of times since his election in 2000, and in 2004, he co-wrote the Time cover story naming George Bush Time's Person of the Year. And in addition, a uh, cover story that he wrote on Carl, he co-wrote on Carl Rove was included in the best political stories of 2003. Um, before his uh, time at Slate, he covered Capitol Hill. He reported on the Gingrich Congress, the House impeachment proceedings, and Senate trial of President Clinton. Um, and before covering Congress, John wrote about economics and the budget process. And during the 1996 national election, he covered the campaigns of Bob Dole, Lamar Alexander, and Steve Forbes. 
He has also written for the New York Times and the Washington Post. He appears regularly on NPR and on MSNBC. He's appeared on the Today Show, NBC Nightly News, Good Morning America, ABC's This Week, and um, the News Hour. Um, and he's a native Washingtonian. He graduated from the University of Virginia with a degree in English. He's here today to discuss his book, On Her Trail, My Mother, Nancy Dickerson. The book is based on her personal papers, television, radio broadcast recordings, as well as newspaper and journal articles and reports, and of course, John's memories. When his mother died in 1997, more than 20 boxes of her personal papers were delivered to his office, which he says included everything from her journals as a little girl to her journals before she had her stroke. And um, in researching John, <laughs> I um, was looking at some of the reviews of the book, and I, and I think Leslie Stahl probably provides one of the best descriptions of the book, and I'd like to um, read a portion of it um, here. John Dickerson's biography of Nancy Dickerson is a raw and compelling portrait of his mother, who was, in a way, the Katie Couric of her time, the first woman to break into the all-male fortress of TV news back in the dark ages of the 1960s. With On Her Trail, John Dickerson has written more than a biography. It is a history of the time with rich news stories about John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, a social dissection of elite Washington. It is, and this may be the most captivating part of the book, a personal confession of life with a mother almost obsessively driven in her career. Some may compare the book to Mommy Dearest, but it is really Mommy Lost and Mommy Found. In the first part of the book, mother and son somehow lose one another. But in the last part, they find each other again on many levels. The book is a mix of solid reportorial digging with the son's sometimes heartbreaking insights. It is bold, shocking at times, and brilliant. As a journalist himself, John has a unique perspective on his mother. A pioneering newswoman who was the first woman news correspondent for CBS television, the first woman to report from an anchor booth and the floor of a political convention, the first woman at NBC to anchor her own newscast, and a wife and mother. Please welcome John Dickerson. Thank you very much, uh, Georgia. Thank you, John. I'm. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here for many, many different reasons. Um, when I grew up here uh, in Washington, I was uh, an intern on the Hill. I also interned for lobbyists, and so I did a lot of research here um, as a young man. I also did research here for the book, and my research associate, uh, Lisa Null, who is here, uh, used to not only work here before I knew her, but uh, spent hours here looking through newspapers and pictures and journals, and uh, all of which was a tremendous contribution. Uh, to the book. So um, uh, we are knee deep in this place uh, with this book. Um, and also because I covered Congress and because last night I was in uh, the Capitol covering this non-Iraq vote, um, I looked over here and thought, and thought, well, I'll be back again. So I'm really delighted to be here and thank you all for coming out on this freezing cold day. Um, I'm going to start uh, at the beginning with the preface of the book because that sort of gives you the outline for the the whole book and and this journey that Georgia so nicely described um, of my relationship with my mother. And then I, I thought I would uh, sort of do something slightly different than I normally do, which is piece together some of the um, uh, moments in Congress, uh, which I covered last night as I was leaving at 8 o'clock and there was nobody around but the security guards. I had, as I often do, um, a recollection of mom and her period in the Capitol walking around when you can hear your footsteps echoing through the halls. And so I'm going to piece together some of her experiences uh, on the Hill when she was there, both as a staffer and as a, um, uh, then as a journalist. So um, let me start then at the beginning. This is from the preface to the book. The first time I ever heard my mother sound nervous, she'd been dead for two years. I was at the LBJ Library in Austin, Texas, listening to a recording of her telephone conversation with President Lyndon Johnson in February of 1964. He had been in office for three months. I wouldn't be born for four more years. 
The White House operator begins, Nancy Dickerson is online too. Yes, honey, says the president to mom. The next time I need a new bathing suit, I'm going to consult you, she warbles. Why is she talking about swimming suits? What's that? Johnson doesn't know what she's talking about either. She says it again. The next time I need a new swimming suit, I'm going to consult you. She sounded so young. I listened to Johnson for hours on C-SPAN, which seemed to have a special channel just for his phone conversations. <laughs> I'd bought cassettes of Johnson's greatest hits for long drives, but I'd never heard her on the tapes. Silence. The recording captures even the regular blip of the reels turning on Johnson's tape machine. He's not responding. I cough as if I were on the line with them. I want her to drop the swimsuit business and move on. Johnson resets the conversation and saves us all. How are you, honey? Fine, thank you, she replies, jittery. She starts to pitch. The reason I'm calling is this. We want to do a story this week without interviewing on television, nothing like that, but we want to follow Jack Valenny all over with whatever he does and take pictures. And he said, I just talked to him, he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Every time I see your camera coming, I'm going to run the other way. And I said, well, we'll run after you. She's trying to make the piece sound fun. With her faint Midwestern accent and precarious cheer, it sounds like she's in a musical and might break into song at any moment. She's also talking very fast, producing entire sentences that sound like single words. Now I'm nervous. No, we don't want any of that, said Johnson slowly. He's gruff, but not irritated. We don't want to take pictures of employees. You'll have more jealousy here than I can deal with now. I've got enough of it between the old ones and the new ones, and there's not anything he's doing that's important enough for your camera. And if it was, it oughtn't to be on camera. <laughs> she tries again, but Johnson shoots her down. He's, vi he's fighting to integrate his staff, like his special assistant Valenti, with the holdovers from the Kennedy administration. He doesn't want her making his task harder. Before the call ends, Mom is able to extract one approval. He will let her film the First Lady and their daughters for the Today Show. That's fine, he says. Very good. And you let me know if there's ever anything I can do for you, okay? Thank you, honey. He hangs up. The tape burps out. The next call starts. Johnson talks to Secretary of Agriculture Orville Freeman about a cabinet appointment. I exhale. I'd been rooting for her so hard I'd forgotten to breathe. I went to the LBJ library searching for scraps of my mother. She had been famous once. She was the first woman news correspondent for CBS television. The textbooks refer to her as the first woman of television news. A few other women had gotten there first, but she was the first one people remember, the first star. Young girls imitated her in the 60s and 70s, interviewing their stuffed animals with the vacuum hose as their microphone. When big things happened, Mom was there, for CBS and later for NBC. She was the first to speak with John Kennedy after he was inaugurated, and she was at Andrews Air Force Base when his body returned from Dallas. She stood on John Glenn's lawn in 1962 and reported on his wife's reaction to his famous orbit. She was on the mall in Washington with Martin Luther King. Lyndon Johnson regularly called out to her by name when he wanted to make news. All of this happened bef either before I was born or after my bedtime. By the time I was old enough to know what the news was, Mom's career with the networks was over. She was still on television once a year or so, but she wasn't like Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor. They were a big deal. We watched them every night on the news. But people kept telling me what a big deal she was. My fourth grade teacher asked me to get her autograph. The mother of the shortstop on my li little the mother of the shortstop on my little league baseball team asked if she was my mother, and when I said yes, she got so excited I thought they might have to call a doctor. How neat for you to have her for a mom. Not exactly. I cared more about riding my bike and playing touch football. She was fine, I supposed. We lived in a big house and famous people came to call, but I was never sure why that mattered or why she did. By the time I was 13, I wasn't confused anymore. I was angry. I hated her. I thought she was a phony and a liar. Everyone still thought she was a big deal, but I thought she distinguished herself at home by being petty, rigid, and clumsy. My parents divorced that year, and I took my electric clock and brown comforter, and I escaped. I moved in with my father. Mom stayed at Marywood, the mansion where she and my father had raised five children, entertained presidents, and smiled on cue for nearly 20 years of celebrity photographers. I would never live with her under the same roof again. At the Johnson Library, I returned the matchbox-sized tapes of LBJ's phone calls to the desk. Mom and I had become, become close before she died, and I wanted to spend a little more time with her memory. But I was late. I had a plane to catch. I still hadn't checked out of my hotel. I hurried back to the Driscoll in downtown Austin. Mom was 32, my age, when she first stayed there in 1960 to cover Johnson's run for the White House. I grabbed my battered bags and raced to the airport, to the airfield used by the private planes. In the parking lot, I made a mental note of where I'd left the rental car. I'd be back in a few days. 
Jesus Dickerson, we've been waiting for you, said someone as I ran out onto the tarmac. I dropped my suitcase at the snout of a Secret Service bomb dog and ran toward the 70, 727 that read Bush Cheney 2000. The flight attendant smiled and handed me a cup of warm enough coffee. They'd seen this mad dash before. My more punctual colleagues in the press were already poking at their laptops and reading the day's schedule. I took my usual seat and straightened out the ruffle of press badges that I wore around my neck. The plane started down the runway. I touched the worn leather box in my briefcase that held Mom's rosary, my pre-flight ritual. Where were we off to? I looked at my schedule. Michigan. Election, election, election day was just two months off. I walked out on Mom, but almost 20 years later, I was following in her footsteps. So that's the preface. This book uh, goes up and it goes down. Um, and most of it, though, is my uh, journey through those 20 boxes, those letters and journals and newspaper clippings and uh, the story of Mom's life and her exciting and fascinating career here in Washington. Um, she grew up in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, came to Washington because she wanted to be where the action was. And so she got a job as a clerk at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And um, I'm now going to string together a few scenes from both her time on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, uh, and then uh, a scene where she first breaks into television news and then we'll come back to Congress. I think that's the way I'm going to do it. Anyway. Mom got addicted to the Senate drama. Each day she could watch all the personal striving, pettiness, glory, generosity, and pride of the human condition. Senators are great theater, especially when they get indignant about their prerogatives. They gave outraged floor speeches and cornered each other to exact promises and trade favors. She loved the sounds of the Capitol, the halls echoing with the click of heels on marble, the tourists asking for directions, and the typewriters clattering in every office as she walked by. Not long after she started at the committee, Mom met the flirtatious Lyndon Johnson. He walked across the room, sat in a comfortable stuffed chair, and put his feet up on her desk. He asked if he could use her phone. I raised an eyebrow at him, Mom said in her oral history in the Johnson Library, making it clear that even for the distinguished majority leader of the Senate, that wasn't the proper place to put one's feet. For Mom, the Senate was like an advent calendar. There was the public show, but if you knew the right trick, you could open a little window and see behind the scenes. When Senator Frank Church downed pitcher after pitcher of water during a hearing, she turned to a colleague and said, he's putting out the fire from last night, knowingly referring to his hangover. When Senator McCarthy's face twitched repeatedly during a hearing, she joked about it later to a colleague. Nancy, her friend, responded, that's not a tick. He's winking at you. The Wisconsin senator wasn't the only one. Chasing women kind of comes with the territory in the male chauvinist Senate, wrote columnist Hugh Sidey at the time, like the springy black leather couches. Mom sources, well, let's, well, I'll, she's not a journalist yet, so let's not uh, give her her promotion until she, she actually gets it. <laughs> let's, uh, so that's what it was like when she was here as a staffer. Well, she didn't like being a staffer. She wanted to be where the action was, and the only way she could do that as a woman was be a become a member of the press. So how was she going to do that? Well, uh, she joined CBS because she knew everyone on the Hill, and they needed somebody who knew everyone on the Hill as well. So um, they hired her, but then for six years they wouldn't let her go on radio. They wouldn't even let her in front of a microphone. She figured the only way she could get herself on air was to get a scoop big enough that they'd have to put her on air. So she went for the biggest game she could find, House Speaker Sam Rayburn. Uh, and this is uh, the story of how she got uh, Speaker Rayburn on television. Um, uh, she had actually done one little group of radio reports from Europe, um, and so uh, she had been on, on the radio but had not yet been on, on, uh, on television. Mom's experience in Europe had confirmed her belief that if she could get a scoop, they'd have to put her on the air. So she picked the hardest target, Speaker of the House Sam Rayburn. The formidable Texas lawmaker hated television. He banned cameras from the House except during a few specified hours each year. He complained to his friend Lyndon Johnson that the damn things were ruining the business of politics. Plus, the bright lights reflected off his bald pate and made him look like he had a star burning on his noggin. <laughs> and so, to most requests, he would say something like, no one has a finer command of the language than the person who keeps his mouth shut, and move along. But the 78-year-old was sweet on Miss Nancy, as he called her, so he agreed to give her a rare and exclusive interview. If she scored such a coup, her dubious producers had said, they would put her on the air. But Nancy, one said, 
If you're interviewing the Speaker of the House, please don't giggle. She did giggle a little, but not because she was flirty and chirpy. She was nervous. Rayburn was a giant, the longest-serving speaker. He had led the Democrats for 20 of his 48 years in the body. Most female television stars start today on a local station interviewing the town gardener about her prize pumpkin. Everyone needs a little time to get accustomed to the lights. No one's first televised interview is with one of the most powerful men in the country. In my first television performance, I forgot to breathe. I was 25, but I looked 10. <laughs> Fortunately, I was on court TV, which was a fledgling operation then, so probably about 14 people saw me. <laughs> I was talking about the prosecution uh, in the BCCI banking case. While I knew intellectually that breathing is crucial to speaking, I couldn't do it. My answers to the questions petered out the minute I started, as if I hadn't inhaled since college. I knew what I was talking about, I just had drywall dust in my lungs. Fred Graham, the host who had worked with Mom at CBS, said, I'm so uh, Fred Graham was the host, he had worked with Mom at CBS. I'm sorry, John, we're running out of time, he said, after I'd barely answered the second question. He looked like he wanted to give me CPR. <laughs> running out of time? It was court TV, they had nothing but time. <laughs> they were just trying to hustle me off the set and bring on a less mumbly guest. The bum's rush must have brought me back to life because I answered the last question with, about political influence with gusto. There's no political influence in my estimation in the prosecution of this case. In my estimation? Who talks like that when they're 25? Someone gasping for air, that's who. Someone should have slapped me. I don't remember what, if anything, mom said about the performance, but she had probably been sympathetic. Her first time was balky, too. Rayburn roared into his office, nearly tripping over the thick TV cables. What have you done to my damn office, he yelled at her. She hadn't exactly told Rayburn that it was going to be a filmed interview. He thought he was sitting down for a little chat with a pen and paper. Get all of this out of here. Oh, it won't take very long, Mr. Speaker, she pleaded. He relented. On tape, Rayburn looks like a character out of a Dickens novel who refuses to give the orphan soup or a seat by the fire. His voice is gravelly and still tattooed with a Texas twang. He can't sit still and swivels in his leather chair. Mom sits at the edge of the desk as close as she can get to stay in the shot, but stay clear of his swinging. She's dressed conservatively in a black suit. You're going to be terrific, she says, putting her hands on his. I'm going to make you a star, he grumbles into his shirt. Well, if I'm not going to marry you, I might as well go on your program. <laughs> she... The real interview starts. It's, it's perfectly fine. They talk about the coming legislative year, his 78th birthday, and the 1960 political campaign. Rayburn seems so much more rich and textured than the men in office today, but maybe everyone looks that way in black and white. When he gives his last answer, she thanks him and then turns and looks to the camera. Now back to Douglas Edwards in New York. She'd heard other pe people say those words, but after practicing them herself so many times, she could barely get them out. She just couldn't believe it was happening. The tape records a few more tries before she gets that closing right. In New York, producer Don Hewitt, who would later produce 60 Minutes, called after the program, we want you on every night. A good housekeeping profile of mom recorded CBS Vice President John Day's reaction. It dawned on him, just as she'd planned it to, that Nancy was the answer to what to do next to spark up their coverage. So that's how she got the job. And after she got the job, um, she used all of those contacts she developed over the years on the Hill uh, to keep getting scoops. One of those contacts, as I mentioned before, was Lyndon Johnson, who was uh, in 1960 running as Jack Kennedy's uh, running mate. And this is, um, as I said, I was over at the Capitol last night, and um, Mom uh, was a, uh, got a lot more on the inside than I did, and she spent some fair amount of time in the senator's hideouts, which are... Um, very special um, places that the senators rarely invite members of the press. Um, in 1960, the Senate was stuck uh, in session during the summer, and Richard Nixon was out campaigning, and John Kennedy was angry about that fact. He had to be here in Washington in the Senate. So Johnson tried to find a way to make Kennedy feel like he was delivering for the ticket and making some use of this time that he was in Washington. So this is a scene from uh, Johnson inviting Kennedy for lunch with some of the older senators. Um, after the nominating convention, and Mom was at this lunch, the only reporter. After the nominating convention, Johnson figured out a way to show he could deliver politically. The senators were in the Washington for a special summer session of Congress, and it was driving Kennedy mad. His opponent, Vice President Nixon, was already much better known and was crossing the country shaking hands and attacking the young liberal Massachusetts senator, while Kennedy was stuck in the Capitol answering roll call votes. 
To show that the time wasn't being wasted, Johnson arranged a lunch for him with old Democratic bulls. Kennedy had not been an inside player with the establishment leaders in the Senate, and Johnson, the majority leader, was offering instant admission to their inner circle. If Kennedy could make the sale at lunch, thought Johnson, he might woo powerful forces in the southern states the candidate needed so badly. Kennedy wasn't thrilled about the lunch because he and his strategists saw the country differently, differently than Johnson. Kennedy had been successful playing the outside game in the Senate and making a national name for himself. He and his campaign advisors didn't believe it was necessary to court people who might be powerful in Washington, but who lacked real power in their states. After all, the Washington Democrats had backed Johnson for the nomination, and it hadn't worked. Johnson invited Mom to the lunch to lower the tension. She was the only member of the press there, but she hadn't necessarily been invited for her professional talents. She was a warming influence meant to put everyone at ease. She knew Jack, and perhaps Johnson knew that his new partner liked to be in the comp company of attractive women as well, the way a thoughtful host might serve an honored guest his favorite wine. The lunch was held in the hideaway of Senator Alan J. Ellender of Louisiana, where Mom had once handed out her mother's cookies. When she walked in, the room was warm and fragrant with the gumbo bu bubbling on the low stove. Georgia Senator Richard Russell, Harry Byrd of Virginia, and John Stennis of Mississippi sat in deep Victorian sofas as if they'd been there since Appomattox. <laughs> as they waited for the nominee, the old men of the club grumbled. They were astonished that the boy, as they called him, had won the nomination. They were pretty sure he was going to lose to Nixon. They were on alert for signs of haughtiness from Kennedy. Since he had won the nomination without them, they imagined he already assumed that when he won the presidency, he would be their leader and have more to say about the nation's affairs than they would. Kennedy arrived late, looking like he'd, been, look, looking like he'd barged into the wrong room. When the door closed behind him, he didn't settle down. He held onto the sheaf of papers under his arm as if he were leaving shortly, or, worse yet, like he might review them while the others talked. He shook hands with each of them, all of them older, and addressed them formally with, Hello, Senator, to which, to which each of them replied, Hello, Jack. As Mom described the scene in her notes, it was as if Kennedy was uncomfortable being chaperoned by Johnson. He didn't want admission to the club LBJ was trying to grant him. The men talked a lot about the food. Ellender, who was known as Chef Supreme, took considerable pride in his cooking. Everyone took several helpings of the okra, oyster, and shrimp tail gumbo, a version of which is still served in the Senate. Kennedy just picked at his plate. Not good enough for the northerner, thought Ellender. <laughs> the conversation never got rolling. Kennedy was vague about campaign strategy, and he kept calling them all senator. They kept calling him Jack. To top it off, Kennedy left before anyone else, which gave them all a preview of the role he had in store for them during the campaign, which is to say, no role at all. The, l the lunch had been, by any measure, a failure. But Johnson kept trying. Even after his guest of honor had left, he said, See, I told you he really was a nice boy. <laughs> All right. The next scene is um, the night after John F. Kennedy's assassination. Uh, Johnson, mom had been at CBS where she'd covered Johnson, and then she switched over to NBC uh, when... Kennedy was assassinated, she went out to Andrews Air Force Base, one of the most extraordinary things that this has happened throughout this book. But I never saw any of this in real time, of course, uh, since I wasn't alive. And since there weren't VCRs, I, we didn't have tapes of any of this. My poor children have, you know, lots and lots of tapes they're forced to watch um, <laughs> of my performance, uh, performances. Um, and, but with mom, there was nothing. So in these libraries and archives, I found and saw for the first time footage, including footage of her uh, and Bob Abernathy at Andrews narrating the return of Kennedy's plane. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't know the body was going to be on the plane. And um, it's extraordinary to watch the camera focused on the plane as the casket descends. And they're learning that what's happening is the body of the president is returning. Um, it's a whirlwind three days, which then turns into a discussion of what a Johnson presidency would be like. Mom on NBC is on a show with Martin Agronsky, and Agronsky and Mom have a small little debate over whether Rayburn really wanted Johnson to run on the Kennedy ticket. Uh, Agronsky asserted that he didn't. Mom asserted in, in a polite way uh, that he did. The minute she came off the air, there was a call from the new president who complimented her on uh, correcting Agronsky, uh, correcting the record, and doing it in a, in a way that wasn't uh, offensive and didn't embarrass Agronsky on TV. He then, at the end of that conversation, invited her and my father to dinner at his house, the night, uh, his first full night as president. When mom and dad arrived at the Elms, the name of Johnson's house, uh, 
The night after the assassination, the president was not yet back from the White House. The Secret Service frisked them down to their underwear as if trying to make up for their own failures in Dallas. Lady Bird was upstairs. She had attended the prayer service that day and visited with Jackie Kennedy. They were greeted by Lucy Johnson, barefoot in a green Chinese robe. Mom and Dad traded small talk with her. Lucy was focused on the irritating restrictions that would come with being a presidential daughter. How would you like to have Secret Service men with you every minute of the day, she asked. Even now, she couldn't talk to a boy late at night without the phone light going on in her parents' bedroom. Her father, seeing it, would either monitor the call or interrupt to tell her that she ought to be asleep. She concluded that living in the White House would only be worthwhile if she could have her own private line. When Johnson arrived, Lady Bird came downstairs on cue with a drink and popcorn. After kissing her hello, the president returned to the subject of mom's exchange with her colleague Martin Agronsky. In his early days in the House, Johnson explained, he was trying to get funds for a public works project, but an older, stronger congressman had opposed it. Johnson maneuvered the program into committee and then onto the House floor. He won the debate on the floor, but in doing so, publicly put down his older opponent. Afterward, Rayburn took him aside and said, Lyndon, you feel pretty smart because you got what you wanted, but you also got yourself an enemy. A really clever fellow would have, found, would have won without ridiculing a man on the way and earning himself an enemy for life. Everyone nodded. Johnson paced. He walked over to the television and started talking back to NBC's Huntley and Brinkley. He was determined that the country should be calm, and, whatever the broadcasting duo, and whenever the broadcasting duo said something he thought was inflammatory, Johnson would bark, keep on talking like that and you'll bring on a revolution just as sure as I'm standing here. His speechwriter, Horace Busby, and Judge Homer Thornbury arrived. The president explained that he'd ordered the Secret Service to protect House Speaker John McCormick because he was worried about a government-wide takeover attempt. That afternoon, the Soviets had made a show of good faith by turning over a complete dossier on Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald's activities during his years in Moscow. Johnson was relieved, but not settled. Maybe they're out to get us all, he said. He was going to keep the armed services on alert. He was sure that assassination... He wasn't sure the assassination was the work of just one man. He worried about conspiracy theories. He talked about how Lincoln's assassination still had un unanswered questions. Damn sure that kind of mystery doesn't happen here, he said. I'm going to make sure there isn't one damn question or one damn mystery that isn't solved about this thing. You can be sure of that. Not one damn unanswered question. He interrupted himself, walking over the phone and pushing one of its buttons. He picked up the receiver. Is this the White House, Johnson said? Oh, sorry. Then he punched another. The White House? Sorry. He looked over at his wife. Bird, come over here and get me the damn White House. <laughs> That's going to have to be changed. The whole damn world could go up in smoke, and I wouldn't be able to get Dean Rusk. <laughs> Take me ten damn minutes to reach the Secretary of State. The White House secretaries, who logged Johnson's activities every day as president, recorded the moment with almost comical blandness. Quote, President Johnson said that one of the first things he would like to do is revise the White House operator system. It was too slow for him. Finally, the president got through to the National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy. He reminded him to get, on those to get those wires out fast to every country recognized by the United States to assure them of the continuity of our government. Then, without irony, after the phone debacle, he told Bundy, I don't want any of them thinking we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Next in the secretary's log is told Nancy about Rufus' bravery. Johnson's first letter as president had been to the Kennedy children. His second had been to the head of the Secret Service, commending Agent Rufus Youngblood. Immediately after the first shots in Dallas, Youngblood threw Johnson and his wife on the floor of the car and covered them. There we were, hunkered down in the car, said Johnson, and he had his body on us. And Bird was hunkered down there with us, too. We were hunkered. Ruford moved, Rufus moved so fast, it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen, Nancy. I didn't know Rufus had that many reflexes. At one point, Judge Thornbury called his daughter to, re to reassure her, just as millions of parents had called their children that night. LBJ took the phone from Thornbury and started talking. Is he your boyfriend, he asked. What's his name, Buddy? Well, put Buddy on. I want to talk to him. Buddy, this is Lyndon Johnson, your new president. Just fine, thank you. Thank you. Need all the help we can get. Well, Buddy, take good care of the little girl who's with you. Johnson was trying to comfort the country one person at a time. All right, uh, the last reading will, um, we're going to skip uh, the rest of the Johnson administration and Nixon. Um, and I'll just give you um, one last scene before we have questions. Um, 
1996, while I was uh, covering the presidential race, uh, mom had a heart attack and a stroke. Um, and it was uh, quite a debilitating stroke that, that um, left her unable to talk for long periods of time. Um, and she suffered in, under that condition for about a year and a half before she passed away. Um, and I spent a lot of time with her. She and I had become uh, good friends when I became a reporter in the early 90s. Um, and so the book, after discussing her career, talks about this period where we became uh, ever-increasing friends and uh, enjoyed covering the news together, even though she wasn't actually covering the news. Um, she certainly was a great help in my learning about it. Um, and this is a scene from, from when she was sick. Um, uh, towards the end of the book. When she had recovered a little, her past became our therapy. It was embarrassing how little I knew. When I discovered a cabinet full of photo albums, I spread them out on the oriental rug. It was like I had just discovered a friend's family trove. The faces are familiar, but you know nothing about the experiences they're having. It's one thing to know your mother is famous in theory. It's another thing to see pages and pages of glossy photographs of her with the key historical figures of the last 30 years. I showed Mom some of the pictures, but got little reaction. So I showed her some pictures of the time photographers that the time photographers had taken of me at work on the campaign trail. That's Dick, she would say, pointing to, my, to a picture of me interviewing Lamar Alexander. No, that's, that's me. She'd called me by my father's name or maybe she really thought it was my father. After a while, she learned the tricks toddlers do, to say yes or repeat the right words as if she understood what was being said. And for a few rounds of questions, I let the trick work, pretending along with her that she knew what we were talking about. But then I had to test her. I'd point to a picture of Nixon. Who's that? Michael, my brother. Sorry, Mike, I'm sure she didn't mean it. A few months into her, into her therapy, I mostly gave up on the identification drills, happy enough that she was talking and interacting. Sometimes she would check her watch and look around, confused. What time is it? I would tell her. I've got to get to work. Then she would drift away. Then one day, a surprise. We looked at a picture of her with Jack Kennedy near the Ohio clock in the Senate. He was a senator at the, se he was a senator at the time, leering, I think it's fair to say, at the young Mrs. Honchman, a clerk of, uh, for the Foreign Relations Committee. I joked, mostly to myself, he's giving you the big eye. He gave every girl the big eye, she said, as clear as can be, and I'm certain with a knowing smile. I didn't know whether I was more shocked that she'd uttered a clear sentence or that it had been Kennedy's indiscretions that had brought her back. My brother Michael came through town on business during my week, one of my week-long stays, and the three of us had lunch at her house in New York. We sat in on her occupational therapy and teased her like we did as kids. I should note before continuing on that we, uh, when we were kids, we were in television commercials with mom. Um, and in those commercials, we used to make uh, lots of fun of her because she occasionally got her lines wrong. One of them was for a, um, a product called Pro Power, which is uh, mercifully off the market. Um, it was a combination of orange juice and milk. <laughs> um, and, um, and she uh, got her... Uh, he got her, long, her lines um, rather confused in, in talking about pro-power, and that will be referred to in here. Um, so my brother, uh, so this is at lunch with my brother Michael. We sat in on her occupational therapy and teased her like we did as kids. She couldn't use her right hand very well, so the therapist made her pick up grapes one by one and tried to teach her to play checkers. This was hard to watch. When I was a kid, Mom and I had sometimes played checkers on a big fuzzy rug in the library with pieces the size of butter plates. Perhaps it was because Michael and I were there, but the therapist said she'd done as well as she ever had. She couldn't handle the grapes, but she moved a few checker pieces at the right time and in the right direction. Though, though she had to do it with her left hand. Her right was just a soft, useless claw. We decided that our teasing had helped, so we gave her more of it. There was a certain comfort in being able to tease her again, because if she weren't sick, that's what we would have been doing. It made us feel a little normal, so we taunted the hell out of her to get her to do things. During the lunch that day, we behaved like teenagers. We all had a little plate of grapes to keep her therapy going, and Michael and I, knew, and I, Michael and I threw them at each other. They bounced off the antiques and imperiled the Daumier miniatures and the Corot hanging on the wall. We knew the idea of them rolling someplace they might never be found would get a rise out of her. And then we went through the old litany, 
her tennis game, her performance in those commercials, the time her chair collapsed beneath her on Thanksgiving. Oh, you kids, she said, smiling slowly. As we kept at it, her right hand moved towards the grapes. It has as much vitamin J as orange juice, I said, repeating her commercial gas. She pinched a grape with her mangled fingers. And as much bread as watermelon, said my brother. We tried not to look at her, but we knew she was concentrating hard. She moved her arm quickly and threw the grape at me. It was the greatest thing I ever saw mom do. So that's the last reading. Um, thank you all very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. I hope you have them. Thank you. Yes. Um, I found, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm very bad at that. I, I always forget to do that. The question was, uh, my accounts are detailed, and so um, what kind of notes did I find? Um, I reconstructed them in, um, in a number of different ways. Fortunately, after the dinner with Johnson, Mom came home and typed up her notes um, on the back of an old Western Union um, uh, sheet of paper. And so there were some notes. In fact, uh, in that chapter, it goes on about some of the other things that were that Johnson said, like that he, at this terrible moment, he wished Sam Rayburn was still alive. Um, and I did that. Then, of course, the wonderful thing about the Johnson um, ass assistants is that they kept notes of his da daily activities. So I had some of that. Um, Homer Thornberry had written about that dinner or that night. So I kind of tried to kind of piece all of the little pieces together. Um, the, uh, the same is true with the Senate. Uh, Mom, fortunately, um, wrote lots and lots of letters home to her parents, and her parents kept all of those um, letters. And so there are scenes in the books of finding these different caches of letters that describe, and they have this wonderful mix of, um, of uh, both discussion. There's a, the, a discussion of what is going on, for example, a party at the Kennedy's house in the late 50s with all of the players there, and she's describing each of them because, of course, at that time the Kennedys weren't so well known. Um, and then at the end she has a laundry list of other sort of items about presents she needs to get for the Hoffman refers, and, and so they have this mix of kind of personal and public. Um, and um, so there were, there were, she kept a lot, and also wonder, fortunately there's a lot in the public record as well. Yes. Uh, the question was how uh, mom influenced me the way I go about reporting in a couple of ways. One, uh, she was incredibly diligent um, and incredibly hardworking before interviews and before really anything. Um, that was it. Was wonderful talking to her old colleagues who would who would talk about being in various places and mom kind of being off in a corner studying and working and. Um, uh, she, there's a great scene in one of these old pieces of footage where she's interviewing a military official, and he says, um, Nancy, I don't think that's a fair question. And she uh, gives this great comeback, which is, I wouldn't have asked it if I didn't think it was fair. Um, which to me, which is just incredibly simple, and he then has to answer it. And it was just incredibly simple and effective, and uh, so I've um, looked forward to using that line. Um, <laughs> And um, I had a, a, a wonderful thing that happened after I'd written the book, um, unfortunately, but I found she did an interview with three other network news anchors of um, President Nixon um, that I go into some detail about because this was after she'd been let go by NBC. And so it was this wonderful – life was very, very tough for her at that time, both personally and professionally. And there was this wonderful moment where she got to be one of the four people interviewing Nixon. And it was just a real – shot in the arm, um, and she worked very, very hard on that. And one of the questions she asked um, Nixon, uh, which she never actually asked him, but in her preparation, she asked him what uh, mistakes, uh, if he'd made any uh, mistakes. And in uh, um, uh, April of 2004, I asked, um, before I'd ever read Mom's notes on this, but I asked uh, President Bush a similar question um, that uh, uh, caused some news. Um, and uh, and, and I'm sort of glad it happened that way because um, it was this. Gr it was just neat to see that sort of you know we were sort of on the some parallel track in some strange way. Um, 
Uh, the question was whether my siblings moved in uh, with my father as well, and if any of them are in journalism. Uh, my siblings are all a fair amount older than me. My brother's the closest. He's five years older. And my sisters, who are really, who are half-sisters, um, uh, though that's a distinction I only make sort of in the book, but we never make in, in our lives, um, are a good a deal older. So they had all moved out of the house um, and when my parents split. Uh, but I, and I'm the only one uh, nutty enough to go into journalism. Yes, in the back. Well, a great deal. The, um, there are pictures in here that are from the LC. Um, there was a lot of, uh, Lisa Null spent a lot of time here um, going through uh, Martin Agronsky's papers. Um, there's a great um, uh, line in here from Murrow's papers um, it, because Murrow was at CBS when Mom started and um, there's uh, some wonderful, um, Mom was assigned to Murrow and uh, he was a little taken aback at that. Um, but once they developed a relationship, he was really a wonderful mentor and throughout her career um, she would cite uh, all of the things he told her. And uh, there's a great letter here from him to her describing how she should handle herself uh, with the CBS negotiations over her contract. Um, and it's very, it's very funny. Um, uh, he says something, essentially he says, um, you know, uh, uh, they'll s they can take anything from you they want and then sell you down the river. But having said that, it is the standard CBS contract. <laughs> Um, so, um, and there, and, and, uh, Lisa would write these, even when we didn't find a specific little nugget, um, there was this great context of what people, Joe Alsop's letters, um, uh, because there's a lot of social history of Washington too, Severide's letters, gosh, we, um, and so you, even if mom wasn't mentioned or she was mentioned in a s sort of offhanded way, the book is a lot about the time and the people around her and the in the city, and so it contributed a lot to that as well. Yes? Thank you. Um, I have to say that as a kid, I loved watching my mom on TV. I think I had to build up my way of watching her on TV. But my question is, um, why do you, when did you write your biography? And in the biography, you were also writing your autobiography at a certain time in your life. You were the brother of a young man. What were the reasons? So the question is, what were the re why did I write this, and what were the reasons for it? Um, after uh, after she died, these twenty boxes showed up some uh, sometime later, really in a late ninety seven, and, and I really started going through them in ninety eight. Um, and if you like telling stories, as we both, mom and I both did, and if you're a journalist and you you get your passion is you know to to have a thing that nobody else has, and then turn around and show other people. Um, and, and this was extraordinary. I mean, these the, the letters and her life, which, again, I'd never seen. I mean, um, uh, the book begins with a rather rough 40 pages or so of what my growing up was like and my view as a 13-year-old, um, as uh, uninformed and raw as that can be. Um, and the person I discovered in these letters and the history I discovered, well, there's two things. One, the person I discovered was, was different than the one I'd known in life. Um, and I found incredibly compelling um, and impressive and uh, and amazing as as a as a mother or as a person. Um, but then, but then separately, if I were just Joe uh, Smith, it was a great story of Washington social history and media history and these anecdotes about the presidents that I'd never read um, before. So it felt like it was a story that sort of had to be told. Um, and uh, the more I started writing it, the more I felt that was the case. Um, so that's what got me going, yes. Did your uh, mother have any interaction with him in prison or have any interchange with him in prison? Um, she did have interactions with him, but I don't, um, I don't remember any clear, I don't remember any clear impressions. I'm just looking here to see if Paley even shows up in the book. He doesn't. Um, uh, General Sarnoff was the one that she had the most interaction with, and there's a great scene of how she essentially talks herself into Sarnoff's office. He was the head of NBC. Um, she had no appointment with General Sarnoff, but she went to his office and said that a good friend of his had suggested she go. The good friend had never suggested she go. She'd never met the good friend. 
Um, and Sarnoff wasn't there that day, but it was just, it's some sign of her moxie that, um, that she just marched into the boss's office in New York. Um, but, uh, so, so that, um, I, w- my father, who's still alive, um, uh, I wish I could ask him because he would probably have the great answer to that question. And I'm sure there is one. I just don't know it. Back. It's a great question. It's the, the question was whether mom uh, viewed herself as a role model or saw herself in the in the history of women um, television. She did, um, in both good ways and ways that that weren't perhaps that helpful to the sisterhood. Um, there are there are great stories and and there are some in the book of people who um, young women who came to Washington who just called her up. A former colleague of mine at Time Magazine, Ann Blackman, called her up. And mom said, "Okay, let's go to lunch." Um, and this was at the height of mom's stardom. And so she was willing to go have lunch with um, a young woman uh, so who wanted to be a reporter. Cokie Roberts tells a similar story. Um, and she loved that um, part, role, and she certainly saw herself in that role. Um, she had, and there's some great quotes when she's trying to get break in at CBS where she's talking to reporters and and bashing her bosses by saying yeah, this is absurd that women aren't allowed on TV and it's very um, she's qu- quite a rabble rouser in, in a sense um, but on the other hand she had incredibly strict st- standards for other women um, and during the 70s when there was um, a lot of promotion of women um, because there were a lot of lawsuits about and in order to get FCC licenses there were legal proceedings and she felt pretty strongly that a lot of women were um, uh, given advancement in the, in the job and didn't deserve it. Um, and that caused tension <laughs> with those women. Um, she also, I think, because she had to do it without a playbook and without any peers, had a kind of a view of, of both family life and um, the mix and the balance of work and family that was, um, that was sort of, you should never talk about it, and I did this these things when I was having kids, and I never talked about it, and so no one ever should. Um, I think women who came afterwards felt like that wasn't helpful because it kept up this notion that you could do two incredibly difficult things perfectly. Um, and I think mom came to uh, sort of that view a- at the end as well, although in a disc- in a there was a big debate with Meredith Vieira when she left CBS 60 Minutes in a fight with Don Hewitt. Um, and mom was interviewed for that and essentially reiterated this position, which was, you know, tough. Um, I, I, I think that was something that, again, women who came afterwards felt was a little tough on them. Yes? Uh, it's a good question. The question is whether ch- uh, Congress has changed when I look at mom's notes and my notes. Um, uh, a couple of different levels. One, you know, at, on a public level that has nothing to do with our personal lives, um, you know, they they were they were much more friendly. You know, the the two sides dealt and worked with each other. Um, they don't c- c- do that so much. When I was covering this last night, uh, you know, the the, um, the Republican and Democratic leader couldn't agree on the rules to even begin the debate on um, you know what is the most important topic of the day. So. Um, um, the posturing is all still the same, and it was the same back then. And and um, there was a, a, a kind of corruption um, back then that's different than what some people would argue is the corruption of today in terms of campaign finance and that kind of thing. Um, um, reporters had a relationship that was much closer to their sources, which was both good and bad. Um, you know, it's not completely gone. I spent when I covered the Hill full time. You know, I had a chance to get. Uh, spend some time in those Senate hideaways, too, and you can, um, after having covered the Bush White House, I didn't know how good I had it, um, because the Bush White House is very closed off, um, and on the Hill, you get a much more, you can really get a sense of the people you're covering, and that's still kind of true today, nothing close to what she got to see. That's still kind of true today. Any more questions? All right. Thank you all very much for listening and for your questions.
Well, I want to publicly thank uh, John Dickerson for sharing his story and his mother's story with us, and I'd like to thank the audience for the excellent questions. I think that together uh, this has been a, a terrific experience and insight about uh, Washington, D.C. and about broadcast journalism that uh, we wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, we're going to have a, a book signing now, and I'm going to ask that uh, John come back here and sit, and if you have not purchased a book, uh, I think there are still a few left, and we can kind of form a line uh, down this way uh, for the book signing. Uh, also, I'd like you, when you go out, and, and I know some of you need to leave right away, uh, take, a look, take a look at the schedule for the next uh, talks that we have coming. The two coming up uh, this month, uh, February 21st, uh, historian Doug Wilson will be talking about his new book about Lincoln, Lincoln's sword and the power of words. And we have just uh, arranged for Sarah Peretsky, the mystery writer, to come on February the 27th. So those will be both uh, presentations plus some other ones that are here. But uh, one last time, please join me in thanking John Dickerson. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.